Howdy, church. Welcome to the book of Galatians, chapter 2. We are continuing on with our weekly overviews. As you're going through the growth book, we pray you're getting incredible things from it. We pray that the revelations that are coming out are changing your life. We pray that uh, every day as you're reading the scripture, it's breathing upon you. It's changing your emotions, your actions. We just believe for the best. And we just know this growth book was literally created, not just for this church, not just for you individually, but for many, many that would come from this to learn the Bible. You know, this is a powerful thing to be a part of. When you are in a transformational season where the Word of God literally, which is sharper than a double-edged sword, is coming and separating your emotions from the realities of God's Word. It separates what you think is God's voice from your mind to what is really God's voice. It separates the enemy's voice. The Word of God divides between joint and marrow, soul and spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And it's teaching us. So we welcome you today. Enjoy your time today as we just go over an overview. Now let's remember what this is all about. Overviews are not giving you every revelation. Overviews are not about trying to give you every single thing. We want you diving into the Word of God yourself so that you will be getting these revelations from the Lord yourself. You see, if I tell you everything, then you might remember a little bit, but it will fade. If God tells you, you'll never be able to shake it. It will stay on your conscience. And uh, you'll have it until you do it. (laughs) Amen. So that's what we want. Remember, you're not available to hear what God wants to tell you next until you have obeyed the last thing he says. Never forget that. Until you obey the last thing God tells you, he's not going to move on into the next thing. It doesn't matter if you change states. It doesn't have to even move houses. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you move countries. People literally I've met over these last years of ministry, literally my whole life, who believe that because they're shifting or they're changing, they're calling it a new beginning. We need a new start. But God literally will still be in the same place, dealing with them with the exact same things that he did in the last state or the last country. Just because we move doesn't mean that all of a sudden it like wipes God's slate clean. He still waits for us to obey the last thing that he told us, and then we get the new thing. So let's not stay in park. Let's keep moving forward as people in God and move forward onto the next thing and the next thing. Let's keep growing. The Bible says we should be going from glory to glory. We don't just stay in one place. Let's keep on moving. So Galatians chapter 2, let's get into this today. I'm going to be able to read all these scriptures with you again because it's only 21 scriptures. So we'll go through it slowly. I'll point out a thing here and there, but once again, we're going to keep this very light. Just an overview. Uh, I know that Pastor Mike did a great job last week and uh, pray that you get something from this as well. So let's remember one thing as we enter in. The books of the Bible were never given verses and chapters until the 14th century. Okay, so even though you're reading chapter one, chapter two, this was all one long letter. So you got to always, I would always recommend this. Always read when you get into a new chapter, read the previous verses of the last chapter and then go into the next chapter. Just you can continue on the thought of what was already happening. Let's invite the Holy Ghost, right? Because before we ever read the word, when, when we encounter the Bible, we're encountering Jesus himself. But as we come into his presence, the teacher of the word, the Holy Ghost himself needs to teach us what he's going to do. So. Holy Ghost, we just invite you right now. Be our teacher. Thank you, Jesus. You're going to show us everything we need to know. And this whole week, God, you're going to be with every single person watching this video, showing them exactly what they need to know, giving them your personal word for the season they're in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why is that important to do that? Because if you go to class without the teacher, you got a textbook, but nobody to teach you the lessons. The Holy Ghost is the teacher of the word, and we need to invite him daily. Galatians chapter 2, verse 1. 14 years later, I went up again. Who's I? Paul. Up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along with me. Titus has his own book in the Bible. We're not reading that right now. I went in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. So it is possible, and there are things that you'll do in your life, not just a few things, but many things you'll do in your life in response to a revelation. So God will give you a revelation about a certain thing and he expects an action. Understand, revelation is not given to you just so you can sit on it. 
Revelation was not given to you just so you can say, I had another revelation. You can write it in your journal or in your notebook and say, man, I've gotten all these incredible revelations, but done nothing with. Revelation is something that it needs a response. It requires an action. Paul is acting on a revelation he was given. But I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. Now that word fear doesn't mean scared. Uh, the word fear there is just talking about Paul says, listen, I've never done this before. I was persecuting the church. <laughs> in, in chapter one, you see what he did. Like he was all about like he was actually fighting against God. So he's like, I'm doing this message with the Lord, but even I need to be checked. You hear that? If Paul himself is saying, even I need some supervision, I need to be checked. What makes you think as a child of God that you don't need accountability? Every single one of us need spiritual accountability, need accountability on our businesses. That's why we got bosses. If you don't have any boss and you own your business, you need to be accountable to God. What are you doing with everything in that business? We all need supervision and accountability. It helps us. Boundaries are something that free us. Boundaries are not things that restrain us. Without boundaries, the Bible says, without vision, the word envision also means without boundaries or purposeful boundaries, uh, the people run rampant, they run wild. So you could be doing a lot of things in your life, think about this, but not getting much results. You could be doing a lot without actually doing anything. I'll say that again. You could do a lot in your life, but because God has not sectioned off the purpose, the boundaries for your life, the exact thing you're supposed to be in, you're working hard, but actually accomplishing nothing for the kingdom and for eternity. Really, really important that you allow God. And the only way that you'll notice this, guys, is through spiritual accountability. You have to be under people. God does this through people, under God first, but then under people who are able to hold you accountable. They keep you in line. They help you not to waste time in life. So Paul goes to these people and he says, you got to check my message. I just want to know the thing I'm saying. I know it's from the Lord. I'm pretty sure, but... I just want to make sure that I'm not doing this in vain. I want to make sure that I'm not working hard, but going to waste my life. I want to make sure that I'm not going to do this whole thing and get to the end. And God's going to say, um, actually, you are completely off. None of it counts. Corinthians says that we will stand before the Lord at the end of our days and we will have to give an account for our life give an account for how we live this life as believers. We're going to have to give an account and say, this is what we did as a believer. And everything that we did in heaven that did not match up to what God's plan was, he will throw in the fire. Doesn't matter if you accomplish many things in your eyes. If it wasn't according to the original purpose God had, it will be thrown into the fire. That is humbling. That is sobering. That is why it's so important to know God's purpose, to seek God for his will for your life, and to make sure you're obeying every step at a time. I'll just say this real quick. This isn't a message on how to find your purpose, but this is really key. Purposes in life are not given in one setting. They're not given overnight. They are outworked one obedience at a time. I'm going to say that again. Your purpose in life You'll get a glimpse. God will always give us glimpses. You know, Abraham, look at the stars, right? Noah, I mean, there's just so many places. He'll give you glimpses of what's going to happen in the future, but he doesn't tell you everything and he does it on purpose because he just wants to give you enough for the next step. So you got to understand, if you don't know your purpose today, stop feeling bad. Just understand, do you know the next step? If you don't know your purpose today, that's not what God's asking. Do you understand the next step? Because God's going to ask you to obey the last thing he said, which will be the next step. And purposes are unfolded over time. They're not given in one instance, okay? So one of the greatest ways that we make sure we're on track with our purpose is we are under accountability. Paul himself goes to the leaders and says, check what I'm doing. Does this sound right? Verse three, yet not even Titus who was with me was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was Greek. This matter arose, circumcision, because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves again. Isn't that crazy? You know, it's not Jesus who's going to make you a slave again, obviously. It's not going to be the angels who are going to make you a slave again. The devil's plan is to make you a slave again. But do you understand he actually can't do it if you belong to the Lord? He has no right to you unless the rights that you give him. I'm going to say this again. 
The devil has no right to do anything or force anything on your life unless you have legally given him access to do it. So he has no right to do anything for you. He can't make you a slave. There's none of that. You have to give him the power of agreement because all authority was taken from him. When Jesus went down to hell and he came up with the keys of the kingdom and all your victory because of what he did on the cross, he said, all authority has been given to me. This means nothing was left to the devil. Then he gives us his authority. The Lord gave us the authority by saying, go preach to all nations and everything else. There was a transfer of authority. So that means now you have the authority. So he didn't have any authority. You have the authority. So he's got to get some authority somewhere. He needs your power of agreement for anything that he does in your life to stick. If you don't agree with it, it won't happen. Hallelujah. So listen to this. These people, and this is the other people that are trying to make you slaves. My point is God won't make you slaves. The devil has no right to make you a slave. Who's going to try to make you slaves? Jealous people. Envious people. People who don't like your success. People who don't agree with all the great things you've been doing. People who... Uh, feel like, honestly, they have been doing nothing in life, so they want to make it their life's goal to destroy yours. <laughs> there are people who feel they are doing nothing in life. They are insecure about their futures. They don't feel they're relevant to anybody. So when they see people who are relevant, doing things for the kingdom and, and are successful in life, it is their job, they feel, to destroy your success. That's sad, isn't it? That's not the way it should be. Let's make sure as believers, we're not those people. If you see somebody else get celebrated, why don't you celebrate them? If you see somebody else get a promotion, why don't you promote them? If somebody else is getting uh, a huge influence and a great thing, just praise God for it. Don't you know that there are millions of people dying and going to hell, guys? Do we really have time to be bickering and competing against each other for our small little circles? For our social media accounts that you have more likes and followers than I do? Guys, listen to the way we think. Can we get back to the big thing, the main thing? There are people who need help all over the world. Do you know what that means? We're going to need as many of us as possible being in our calling and our purpose and to have influence as many of us as possible. Every person you see gaining influence who is a Christian, praise God for them. Clap your hands in celebration because now another person is getting more influence to possibly a lost soul who is depressed, who is committing, who is, who is uh, in a place where they don't want to live. I mean, the, the, the enemy is after people all over the world and we need every hand on deck, guys. We are the body of Christ in order to bring this and, and fulfill this great calling commission that the Lord has given us. Don't ever worry about jealousy anymore. Be delivered. If you're jealous, be delivered. Don't envy somebody else's life, especially people's lives who aren't even saved. We have people in church who are envying people's lives on social media that they follow, on YouTube. I'm telling you, these people aren't even saved and you're, you're jealous of their life. Nothing that they do will count, guys, in heaven. It wasn't God's work. It wasn't for the kingdom. Please keep your focus on the prize, the prize and the high calling that Jesus has set before you. Stay under accountability like Paul did so that you can succeed. Verse five, we did not give in to these people for a moment. We didn't let them make us slaves. Don't give in to the enemy. Don't give in to the enemy through people. It might be a person, but it's the enemy trying to use a person. Know what the spiritual source is so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. As for those who seemed so important, whatever they were makes no difference to me. <laughs> God does, judge, does not judge by external appearance. Another translation said, God cares nothing about your titles. Man. Oh, Lord. We're all about titles, aren't we? Well, I'm the chief executive of the head of the monarchy of the monastery. <laughs> I'm the assistant to the chief's assistant. To the, so I got clout. I should be able to tell you what's going on. Y'all, if you're in a situation you feel like you got to use a title... In order to, to get somebody to do what you want, you are a manipulator, you are a controller, and you have not earned the place of respect. Any time that you feel you have to pull out a title in order to get somebody to do something, it's because you have not earned their respect through serving them. You get respect through serving people. You get respect by being the person who, when you say something, it happens. There's many ways to gain influence with people. We're not going to talk about them on this one, but I'm telling you, there's a lot of ways to do it in a godly way. Don't 
pull out the cards of your number, of your names, of, you know, I have had this. I mean, people use influence to try to manipulate people. people. People use their platforms to try to domineer over people. Guys, the only thing we're supposed to be competing in, you know what the Bible said, is in serving each other. The Bible gives us the rights to compete in one thing, service. Outserve one another. God's like, go at it. Go for it. I give you all rights to compete in outserving one another. Go for it. Come on. Pick up a towel. Wash somebody's feet. Why don't you serve somebody a meal? Why don't you compete in that? Why don't we compete in serving the widows that are around us, the orphans that might even be in a home but have not been parented? Why don't we compete in loving and taking, in, in taking a place of responsibility and loving these people? Come on, let's compete in serving. So he said that these men added nothing to my message. Matter of fact, verse 7 continues, On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter, who had been to the Jews. Verse 8, For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter and the apostles and the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. The same God who used them is the same God who's using me. Please realize that the same God who's using you is also using others. Be happy about that. Verse 9, James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. For you would be this hand. This is my right hand, but for you right now, this is your hand. You're right. Yeah. The right hand of fellowship when they recognize the grace given to me. You know, I've heard a lot of jokes about, man, we were given the right hand or the left foot of fellowship, meaning they were kicked out of the church. Or the right hand. That's not what this means. The right hand of fellowship means they were given a place of acceptance and they were, uh, uh, you know, agreed in. However, still it's funny. Um, they agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they too, the Jews. Verse 10. All they asked, I love this, this is the only bit of information and, and advice they had for Paul, was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Never forget the poor. You know why? Because James 1.27, pure and undefiled religion in the eyes of God. You might have your religions. You might have your doctrines. You might have your, um, your different denominations. But Jesus says, if you want to know what religion is that's pure to me, rescuing orphans and widows and keeping yourself unspotted for the world. Never forget the poor. Verse 11, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. This is a serious story because he was clearly in the wrong. Verse 12, before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Verse 13, the other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that they, by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. So let's look at the pattern here about hypocrisy. Number one, you act like a hypocrite. It spreads to others who act like hypocrites, and then it spreads and it spreads. So hypocrisy is contagious, is what he's saying. Hypocrisy is contagious. If you are saying that you are a Christian and you're a believer, but your lifestyle is not living up to that, if your lifestyle is not saying what you are saying, if your life is not saying what you are speaking, if it is not having, if your life is speaking a message, but your words are speaking a different one, that is called hypocrisy. And he's saying that Peter's doing this, but guys, that's contagious. You want to make sure you're living the real deal. You don't want your children to be hypocrites. You don't want you to be your, your family, your, your marriage. You want to be a person who's the real deal. God will help you do it. Philippians 2.13. It is God is giving me the desire and the power, Philippians 2.13, to do what pleases him. God is the one who's working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Don't be worry about being a fake. You don't have to worry if you lean on God. Verse 14, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Why are you asking them, Peter, to do something you're not doing? You ever thought about that when we're witnessing to our families? Why do you think they're going to want to come to church if you're still depressed, if you're still full of agony, anxiety attacks? They're looking at your life. Listen, let God give you freedom. Let God give you a breakthrough. Let God show you his love. Be full of joy. Guess what's going to happen? They're going to see you're full of joy. Be free from your addiction. Guess what's going to happen? They're going to see you got free. That's the greatest message you could ever preach. 
Hallelujah. Verse 15, we who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. You are not saved and justified because you memorize this Bible. You're not justified with God. You know what justified means? I mean made just. You are made just before God. You have a just before God. You are not reconciled to God. He's not loving you. You're not doing all of these things because of anything that you're doing for him. You are saved because of your faith in the sacrifice Jesus paid on Calvary and because he rose from the dead. That is why you're saved. You believed it. God tried to make it as easy as possible for you because he knew it was impossible for you to be made right with him and be made just. You are justified by your faith, not by any of these things that you're doing. You do them because you want to please God. That is totally true. But you're not justified by those. You're justified by the sacrifice of Jesus. That's the only sacrifice that's good enough for you to go to heaven. So we too have been put our faith in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Verse 17, if while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. That's a big deal. Does Christ promote your sin? No, it's right there. He doesn't say okay to sexual abuse. He doesn't say okay to hatred. He doesn't say okay to unforgiveness. He doesn't say it's okay um, to, uh, for homosexuality. He doesn't say it's okay to be a liar. He doesn't say it's okay to gossip. He doesn't say it's okay. Just because you have sin, understand God is loving you, but he hates the sin. He doesn't hate you. He hates the sin. This is an important thing to remind people of. God hates sin. Why? Because sin separates God from that person. God wants the person. He wants to love them. He wants to bless them. And sin is this roadblock. It's this wall in between you and God. It separates us from God. That's why God hates sin. But he loves you. But he does not love your sin. It is not okay. Just do not misrepresent and misinterpret God. We live in a culture and a society right now that's all about, you know what? If you, you know what? Just accept them. You know what? Don't make them feel unaccepted. There's a Christianity that is uh, available right now called progressive Christianity, which literally the greatest sin in progressive Christianity is not disobedience to God's word. The greatest sin is don't make somebody feel unaccepted no matter what. Listen, just because God loves them doesn't mean he accepts their sin. God loves you. He does not accept your sin. He accepts you once you repent. He wants you to come as you are, yes, but he wants you to come as you are and repent. And then God accepts everything as his responsibility because you have repented and you've asked God for help. If you don't even think what you're doing is wrong, God doesn't accept that. He loves you still. He loves you whether you'll turn to him or not. But to accept what you're doing is a totally different thing. He's a holy God, y'all. He does not accept the sin that you're in. He wants to set you free from the sin that you're in. Come on. He doesn't accept it and just coax it and pet it. And it's like, oh, it's okay. I don't want to make you feel bad. No, he wants to set you free so you're not depressed. So you're not under the binds of this sin and this addiction anymore. He doesn't accept homosexuality and just, I'm just going to say, no, he wants to set you free because it's not his best. He doesn't accept that you're a liar and just, oh, it's okay. No, he wants to set you free so the truth can be put in your mouth and you can deliver people because the truth will set you free, man. All right. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. Last couple of verses, last three, verse 19. For through, though the law, through, through the law, I died to the law that I might live for God. Verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Oh, that's such a good verse. You got to memorize this verse. Y'all memorize this verse. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me. 
It's no longer you who's doing it. It's Jesus through you. It's no longer you who's going to your work. It's Jesus through you. He's going through you. He's going to help you. He's going to be. You'll, your hands become his. Your feet become his. Your eyes become his. Your mouth become his. It's not me anymore. It's Jesus. That's why you can have confidence. Supernatural confidence comes when you hand over your body, your vessel, as an instrument given to the Lord because it's no longer I who live. But it's Jesus who speaks wisdom through me that I didn't even know how to speak, who says things through me that I didn't even know how to say, who lays hands and things begin to happen, who walks into places and favor walks with me because I carry the Son of God. I'm carrying Jesus, the vessel, the mighty anointed one is inside of me and he's changing atmospheres around me because he is who he is. Hallelujah. Last two verses. Oh, last one verse. Verse 21. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Let's thank God right now for his grace. Let's thank God for how amazing and beautiful he is. Grace, remember, is not a cover up for your sin. Grace does cover. But do you know that's not the main definition of grace? We should stop saying, I sinned again, but thank God for his grace. It's not just a covering. Grace is the empowerment God gives you to do his will and his purpose. Grace is God's power going through your life, overtaking all your limitations. Grace is God's ability that is overtaking all of your natural ability in the place that you fail. Grace is God working literally through you, through his power, which over exceeds your power so that you can do his will. Man, we'll talk about grace some other time, but it's so beautiful. We have God's power. It's God's ability that is superseding your ability so you can do his will. You know, you can't do God's will without his grace. Not his mercy and kindness only, but his ability, his power. It's not just a cover-up, it's power. You have power today. Thank you so much for joining us today for this Devo, this devotion. Galatians chapter 2, we love you. Hope you're excited. Have an incredible week. When you're in the Word, take your time. Get some worship music on. Invite the Holy Ghost every time. Let your atmosphere become a place that is very peaceful so that you can focus and get what God wants you to have. God bless you. We love you all. See you as the services. Thank you for being a part of our family. Um.